Okay, I think we're going to get started, if everyone's okay for that. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to our talk today on operationalizing uh, sustainability in Kubernetes. In other words, how to care about the planet from behind your desk. Uh, just to give a brief intro, so my stunning colleague on the right here is... Oh. I see too stunning, um, is Gabby. Gabby is an amazing platform engineer, incredible system engineer, and a very mediocre snowboarder. Uh, this is why she's actually interested in saving the planet. She needs all the practice she can get. Well, he's not wrong. I'm better than him. <laughs> uh, Brendan is a very versatile engineer, front end, back end, networking, telecom, you name it, he's probably done it and well. Um, his passion, he has passion for knowledge and bettering himself and those around him, which really feeds into his work that we do at Resync and his own personal blog called thegreencoder.io. So that's a little about us. And uh, we work for a company called Resync. So uh, this is kind of why we wanted to do a talk uh, on this specific topic. Um, we've been doing research into um, just the impact on the climate that uh, IT has had um, as part of our work at Resync. And Resync is just a consultancy that's looking to reduce IT-related uh, impact on the environment, um, and mostly just consulting on best practices. Great, so before we dive in, um, we're gonna get on the same page and provide a bit of context. Uh, specifically, why are we bothering to talk about this? Um, what are CO2E or what is CO2E? And how do you measure sustainability and how do you measure that in a full system and in a virtualized system? So just bear with us through the theory. We do have some uh, pretty cool experimentations at the end. Um, so to start off, what is carbon equivalent emissions? So Generally, we talk about carbon equivalence, which is um, an overarching term for um, any kind of greenhouse gas, so methane, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, obviously. And um, we call it carbon equivalent specifically because we, yeah? Sorry, first time on stage, just <laughs> FYI. Uh, <laughs> Um, we call it carbon equivalent because essentially we measure all of these gases in terms of their heating emission compared to carbon dioxide. Um, and obviously everybody's heard of the big bad carbon dioxide. Now, if you see any of these two symbols, these designate any greenhouse gases and not only carbon dioxide. Um, right. Why should anybody care about this? Well, the IT sector currently uses around 5 to 10% of uh, the world's electricity. Um, we then change that into greenhouse gas emissions. That's 2 to 5% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Now, at scale, that's a monstrous amount. When we moved to the cloud, we had this idea of the infinitely scalable cloud. Um, you can pretty much uh, set up any of your applications in minutes. You don't really care about optimization um, as much. Obviously, it does, uh, does like come into effect at some point. And with this in mind, we've slowly started seeing this huge scope creep of um, redundancy and waste of uh, server utilization. To us, we're uh, hoping that IT should be part of the solution and definitely not part of the problem. And essentially, we have to face the facts. Paper straws just aren't going to save us. Uh, so great. Now we know what carbon emissions are, but how do we measure them in our systems? Because um, with, without the ability to measure, it becomes challenging to optimize and reduce since we won't have the means to quantify those changes effectively. So first, um, to calculate the total carbon emissions, it's composed of two parts, um, the embodied emissions and the operational emissions. And if you were aware of the SCI, this is very similar to that, but just without the rate because we didn't require the rate in our calculations. So we just focused on these two components. And so Brennan's going to talk about what embodied emissions are. All right, so um, we've kind of gotten into this mindset that carbon emissions is a synonym for electricity or power usage. And unfortunately, this misses a huge part of the puzzle. 
um, when we're looking at uh, IT hardware, um, we're essentially missing a huge percentage of the emissions as part of the manufacturing life cycle and supply chain to get the hardware where it needs to be. We look at a general server that's used by a lot of cloud providers, um, the Dell PowerEdge R740, and shout out to Dell, they have an amazing research uh, on every single hardware component that they push out and the emissions that it produces. And in this case, we're looking at about 15 to 16% of the emissions is part of the uh, manufacturing uh, and end of life uh, uh, parts of the server. Now, this is based on a, oh, obviously the question is how do we reduce it because we don't really have control over these uh, emissions. These, uh, this percentage is based on a four year life of a server, right? Now four years was the default a couple of years ago for most data, uh, data centers. And what a lot of the cloud providers have started doing or data center providers is they've increased their server lifespan by two years, right? Um, so Google Cloud, AWS, and Azure all are, have the same uh, six year life cycle at the moment. And this has reduced the carbon, uh, the embodied emissions of those servers by about four to 5%. Now, AWS specifically has actually reported that just increasing the lifespan of their servers has given them around a $900 million benefit um, in profits because they're not spending that money on upgrading servers. Well, in any industry, you obviously get overachievers. Um, there's actually a company, there's a booth downstairs that you can go and visit if you have questions. They've figured out how to increase their server lifespan for up to 10 years. And uh, this is Scaleway. Now, Scaleway did a very big um, research on all their data centers and found out that in most of the instances, the component that failed in their servers was the RAID controller, and this is due to the RAID controllers having batteries in them. And nowadays, a lot of the servers don't actually require hardware cards, right? So by removing the RAID controller and retrofitting these servers, um, you can actually push the lifespan of these servers up. Now, they did this by around 14,000 of their servers, and uh, there's an awesome blog post about it. And this is also one of the strategies that they've incorporated to try and get ahead of the worldwide chip shortage that we're seeing due to um, our friends in the AI department. Okay, and uh, now that we know what embodied emissions are, uh, we're gonna look and talk a bit about operational emissions since these will be what you probably have the power to optimize over the most. Um, so operational emissions uh, can be calculated well, they are, they're essentially the workload you're running on your server. And they can be calculated by the energy consumption by a grid carbon intensity coefficient. Yeah, that's a mouthful. We'll get to that later, but first we're gonna talk about uh, energy consumption. And that's the amount of power being utilized over a period of time. And uh, you can get that for a server in a couple ways. Um, I'll show you two, but there are definitely more, like eBPF, if you've been to the Kepler talk, and other ways. But one of those is smart plugs. They're probably the most precise measurement because you, they can give you the um, entire power consumption of whatever's plugged into it and can give you the consumption of the entire system. They have built in Wi-Fi and API. And a second um, uh, measure, way to measure is called running average power limit or RAPL for short. This was developed by Intel and it's a hardware component um, on your chip and can expose real time power metrics of different power domains like CPU, GPU, and RAM. Um, it's exposed by the power cap uh, framework, which is an interface between the kernel and the user space. And so if you ever wanna know if your system has access to that, you can just look in the power cap directory. Um, and if it is present on your system, this can be utilized by various tools, uh, including the Prometheus node exporter and another being Linux perf. And so as you can see, these are some of the domains that you can measure. And we're gonna do a little measurement of my laptop and we'll focus on the energy package domain because that is the energy consumption of the entire uh, socket. So pretty much the cores, the GPU, and the on-core components like the L3 cache and the memory controller. So it's as similar as measuring the whole system as you can get based on that. 
So I ran this on my laptop uh, the other day and used stress ng to force a load of 85% over 10 seconds of time. And as you can see, it reported 313.49 joules of power was being used. So now that we know how to get energy consumption, let's look at the grid carbon intensity coefficient. So this is a coefficient that um, represents how many grams of carbon dioxide are being released into the atmosphere per kilowatt hour of electricity being created. So it's pretty much the intensity of your carbon. If it's a higher number, that typically means the electricity created is probably from a coal plant or another not so great source. However, if it's a lower value, it probably depicts wind or solar power, and that's what you want to aim for. Um, uh, one way of being able to get that value is a tool called electricity maps. They provide real-time data of the uh, carbon intensity at a, for a specific region at a period of time. So on Monday when I was running that perf command, um, the carbon intensity was about 40 grams here in France. And great, so if we're going to put it all together and get the total um, operational emissions based on the RAPL command and the uh, carbon emissions, or the carbon intensity, uh, we first convert joules to kilowatt hours to go from power to energy and then multiply that by the coefficient and we get 3.4 times 10 to the negative 4 grams of carbon from just that little running. So now we know how to do it for a full system. <laughs> we need to talk about virtualized systems, right? Because in most instances we're talking uh, cloud providers, data centers, where we don't actually have access to the um, underlying hardware components. So we have checked cloud providers aren't really keen on us walking into their data centers and starting to plug in some smart plugs. Um, we're still waiting for responses. Uh, even though RAPL is quite accurate, most providers have disabled access to it. Um, there's a CVE uh, where privileged users with local access were able to access unauthorized disclosure of information. Um, so in virtualization, we need to start jumping to the different components that actually use power in any system. Uh, this is mainly the CPU, the memory, the storage and networking. Uh, storage and networking do play a part in power consumption, but in any system, majority of the power usage is memory and CPU. Uh, this is depending on what system you're looking at and workloads, of course. We also have to face the fact servers are complicated. There's different compiler flags that you can uh, run with servers. There's different hardware components, different energy profiles. And unfortunately, cloud providers aren't really forthcoming with all the different configurations that they have uh, uh, set up underneath. So what uh, the tendency for a lot of uh, tooling in this area has done is we, they've started using machine learning models based on a database called the Spec Power Database, um, which is ju just a huge database of hardware components with uh, their full energy profiles. And using this idea with information that we actually do have around virtual machines, we can then, such as the CPU type, the memory type, different utilization levels, we can then uh, run that information through these machine learning models to get an estimate of the current power consumption of a server. So we are seeing different machine learning models being used. So I've seen k-means, SVM regression, um, not so much linear, like full linear regression models. Uh, however, all these models, we are still a bit in the dark due to the lack of data from the cloud providers. I'm iterating that in case there's anybody that works for cloud providers, come chat to us afterwards. Um, to sum it up, how do we measure uh, power consumption and emissions in our systems? We make a whole bunch of assumptions, a whole bunch of estimations, and whatever data we can uh, glean from uh, cloud providers. Hint, hint. Okay, now that we've chatted at you for a while, let's get to the good part on how you can actually optimize your clusters for carbon emissions reduction, reducing carbon emissions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've got um, this idea of time shifting, which uh, we'll go through first. As an industry, we've run cron jobs for I don't know how many decades, and the idea behind time shifting is we slowly move our workloads to shift um, to schedules that coincide with lo uh, lower carbon intensity. 
uh, in any given day, so this was a Monday morning, and um, as you can see, the carbon intensity does fluctuate throughout the day. That nice big orange spot over there is otherwise known as the sun, and uh, happens between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Not in Amsterdam in winter. <laughs> um, however, with such a uh, green energy source, we do also notice that carbon intensity is much higher during the day between these times due to most of us working. So literally just shifting your workloads to later on in the evening, so between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m., you do get a drop in uh, carbon intensity for your workloads. We also have this idea that uh, not all workloads can uh, shift uh, in time. So if you do need to run your workloads at a very specific time, you can shift your workloads to run in different regions that do produce greener energies. Um, with my little uh, experiment, we had uh, the Netherlands Monday morning when I started working, uh, we had a 404 gram carbon intensity and if I was to run my workload, that's essentially what uh, my workload would be using. If we shifted it to our northern neighbors, still in Europe, still under GDPR, um, I do understand that running your workloads in different regions does come with some uh, compliance and security concerns. Uh, we have a carbon intensity of 24 gram uh, per kilowatt hour, right? Now, exact same workload, all I'm doing is shifting it from Netherlands to uh, Sweden, and I'm getting a 95% reduction in carbon emissions for my workload. Uh, and with that idea, we get, um, or with these two ideas combined, we get this follow the sun methodology, which is very much stolen from our support engineering uh, colleagues, where you've got a engineer in every time zone to kind of follow the support. And follow the sun in emissions, we're talking about the software following wherever the carbon intensity is lowest. And this is being designated as carbon aware software. So your carbon is actually aware of the carbon uh, intensity uh, that it runs on. Now, this is one of the four running ideas in the industry in how to reduce your carbon footprints. And we didn't really feel like going too much into implementation details on this because it is very, 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 very well documented. Yeah, so then we decided to think, well, how would node utilize, utilization come into effect with this? And it was observed that a majority of utilization is only sitting between 10 and 20% on servers. So this graph may be from 2009, but we found um, other data that was very comparable, like McKinsey and company found 15% of glo or global utilization falling around 15%, and then in 2022, IBM found that server utilization was only falling, falling in between 12 and 18% of capacity. So not only is that limited utilization a waste of idle resources, but let's look at how it affects the carbon emissions. So um, when comparing the rate of utilization of, um, based on power, it, it's easy to kind of assume that they would be linear, right? The, the more workload you have, the more power you would need to power that. But that's actually not correct. The rate um, of power consumption as utilization increases actually decreases, which means the more utilization, the more value you'll be getting out of your energy consumption. And so we wanted to show how this played into effect with a little of experiment. So just to set the stage for the experiment, um, we try to keep as many variables consistent as uh, you know, we wanted to make pretend scientists. And um, we created a single cluster, single control plane. We used Google's microservices demo just because we felt like it's a good representation of uh, workloads running nowadays. Um, we set the region um, to Europe West 1. We turned off any autoscaler. We had uh, two node pools um, with a single node in each. Uh, one of the nodes had four vCPUs, one of the nodes had eight vCPUs, and um, we removed all the resource limitations on uh, any workloads that we were running. So they could essentially grow and shrink as they needed, as they wanted. Um, we then scaled the load incrementally in tens, and we left around 20 minutes between 
um, each scale to see the effects that would occur. Uh, yeah. In order to measure, we used a CNCF tool called Kepler. Kepler is a eBPF based um, power, uh, power uh, it measures the power on your Kubernetes cluster, sorry. Um, we also decided that um, we needed something that also measured the full underlying system. Cloud Carbon is a terrible name. We're looking for a new name and we appreciate that. Uh, but essentially, we created our own tool that measures VM utilization and converts that to emissions as well. Great, so as Brendan said, um, we use the Google Microservices demo and um, it comes with a load generator and we started with one instance and then we incremented uh, by 10 instances every 20 minutes. And so as you can see, as time progresses between the first to the 10 instance uh, jump, it's about 400 watts and 0.4, sorry, 0.4 watts. And then as you see between like the, the 50th to the 60th instance, when we made that 10 instant jump, it dropped to about 0.1 or 0.05 watts of energy. So showing this, it's showing that nonlinear rate of growth and rate of change, and it, the arc is very similar to that um, energy proportionality graph. So in other words, the more utilization, the more value you're getting out of your energy consumption, better for the planet. Now, this um, was where we started bringing in our tools. So Kepler um, specifically uh, measures like containers and namespaces in Kubernetes, right? So if we look at the previous graph, we notice that the increase uh, was very similar because it was actually measuring the exact same workload. What we wanted to measure was the, virtual the underlying virtual machines of each. Now, the, under, uh, the blue line at the bottom is the VM with four vCPUs. And you'll notice that it has greatly less emissions than the, uh, the VM with eight vCPUs. Yeah. Now, um, this is because more vCPUs equals you need more energy to run it, right? Uh, as we increase, the increase is, um, again, uh, proportional but not linear. And we get to a point where the smaller node actually started flatlining at 100% 100, uh, 100 utilization. We don't recommend this for any workloads ever, so this was just an experiment. But the bigger node actually had a lot more space to grow. So as the utilization of the bigger node increased, it could still increase uh, in energy consumption. Which, yeah, we don't want you to flatline your nodes, run them over 100% or 100% utilization. So we wanted to see how um, auto scaling would take effect and change these change this information. Um, so as you know, auto scalers is pretty recommended and well utilized in Kubernetes, um, both in the way of scaling up to handle load and scaling down to not waste resources. Um, and the autoscaler typically uh, makes these decisions based on the resource requests that are specified in the manifests. So what we did with our experiment is we enabled autoscaling, but then we also set the resource request for that load generator um, deployment to be 300M. And this is because this is what Google specified in it to be, and we figured they know their application better than we do. Let's go with the default. And um, yeah, we ran the exact same experiment. And this was, these were our results. So um, the bigger nodes are the green, and the smaller nodes are blue. And as you can see, the smaller nodes had scaled up to five, and the larger nodes only scaled up to three. But the total emissions, or the, uh, energy being used was about five watts for the small nodes, and the large nodes only hit about three, whereas before, uh, you see it only got to about 1.6 watt, watt hours. So, um, yeah, utilizing more resources is, it causes more energy consumption, um, especially because the CPU utilization was only sitting at about 20 to 30%, and that's leaving a lot of room for more, Growth. Yeah, more commands. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, so then we thought, okay, well, let's try to set the resource request to 100 and see then how that will manage with the autoscaler. And as you can see, it performed a lot better. There are a lot fewer um, 
a lot fewer energy being consumed, and the CPU was being utilized a lot, a lot more with 50 to 60 percent utilization, and um, only the smaller nodes uh, increased to two, and they reached about 2.5 watts of energy consumed, and the big nodes never even had to scale up. So, um, with that. Um, Utilize your nodes more. <laughs> uh, take, the, take the time to analyze your workloads and understand your resource requirements and what you need. Don't just throw resources at your clusters because you can. Yeah, really take the time to utilize them effectively and um, get the more value out of um, your energy that you're using. And I would also um, just like to point, when you do utilize your nodes, uh, nodes more, I mean, exact same performance, your application's running nicely, um, but you're using about half the amount of energy um, that you would in an uh, optimized environment. And yeah, the fewer loads, less carbon. Let's just hit that home. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are ongoing with our research. Um, if you have any feedback, any comments, any questions, please reach out to us. Uh, there's all of our handles, uh, LinkedIn, where a friendly bunch, no matter how we look. Uh, Resync.com is our company. We have a blog there. We have uh, my personal blog, thegreencoder.io, where we're just trying to get the information out there for everybody to be able to take control of their uh, climate-related impact. Yeah, we'd love to collaborate and answer any questions. Yeah, and then uh, just a quick thank you. Uh, obviously, talks are quite intense, so Thank you to Anna and Jessica for all their help. And yeah. And our team at Resync. Yeah. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs>
um, and just kind of doing that uh, research on how much a VM actually uses to run versus uh, you know scaling up your system. I mean, the optimal solution, and I am going to say it, is to just turn everything off. Um, companies don't like that answer, so uh, it is something we're actually looking into. We're going to take a lot of this and start posting a couple of blog posts on different uh, things that we're researching, and this is definitely something that we will be looking into. Thank you. Just done? Yeah? Well, oh, there's one here. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I would like to know if you started any reflection uh, on um, the useful workload. What I mean is that most of the time you have, let's say, your application workload, and then you have the rest, meaning metrics, uh, uh, stuff like this, and um, is there any indicator that you are uh, reflecting on that talks about percentage of useful workload. Bus business value versus business yeah. support. Yeah. Um, we have started looking into this, and I think there's actually quite a big push, especially in the monitoring um, groups, to kind of condense uh, monitoring tools to be like one or two agents per node, that you're not running like five agents for your logging, your telemetry, et cetera, et cetera. So this is definitely an indicator that we are looking at, but unfortunately, business support and business value do go hand in hand a lot of the time. So if you don't have the business support, it might decrease your business value, and it's very difficult to kind of put any kind of numbers towards that. So uh, I think in general, open source tooling needs to maybe come together and try and like lessen their footprint because at scale, I think that could be the best option for this specific problem. Yeah? Oh. <laughs> for the experiments that you run, what uh, what was the um, OS you use for the nodes? Because yeah, I was wondering if like this big chunk of uh, energy that you saw like was used at even without workflow had to do maybe with uh, high resources of the operating system, and if you did any research like changing operating system, if you find one which was uh, more energy, um, yeah, less energy hungry. Um, we haven't done any research to that side. That would be really fun. I want to try to do that maybe next. Uh, I think we use the container optimized Yeah, image. it's the Google's uh, container D um, runtime. So it's like the read-only file system with, uh, it's COS, right? I, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, forget the name, but it's essentially uh, the one that just runs the containers and nothing else. That's, that's a really good question. And uh, yeah, I don't know, I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I have a question regarding the shift your workloads approach to maybe Sweden. <laughs> um, have you any take on um, automating the process? Because it sounds kind of hard to do this manually, <laughs> like you provision resources in your cloud provider and maybe your saving plans and something. Um, there is actually, uh, the Green Software Foundation has a, um, a C Sharp library or .NET library, I think, called Carbon Aware SDK, where they're actually trying to uh, incorporate this, and there's a lot of research around it. So I think it's still in its early stages, um, but I do see it seeing traction, especially with the European Parliament's new laws coming in, that uh, companies are going to want software that does kind of uh, go down in carbon intensity. So. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, it's, It sounds like the cloud provider is in, in charge for this um, to automate those uh, features because if every user who uses Kubernetes in the cloud, uh, I think it would be very hard if everyone develops its own solution for this. 100%. And uh, again, calling on all cloud providers to be more transparent with their data. Same. I think the booth are uh, one step down here. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Good. I know it's lunchtime, so uh, don't feel like uh, you need to stay. You can go eat. But yeah, thanks for Thank coming you. and thanks for listening. Thank you.